All right, so made it through week one. Here we are, week two. We're going to start talking about descriptive statistics. Now, the beginning of descriptive statistics in your book is simply on a concept of frequency. Frequency is hopefully a pretty self-explanatory term. It is nothing more than how often something happens. That is, how frequent is it? So frequency is a, a basic idea in statistics about understanding how often stuff happens, which is used for the construction of distributions and whatnot that we'll see later. So we're going to talk about frequency and why do we care about these frequency distributions? Okay, so we already identified what frequency is. What is this idea then of a distribution? A distribution, you think about how something is distributed, it has to do with the way that it's divvied up, right? Um, so if we talk about I have $100 to distribute among three friends, if I give one friend $60, one friend $20, and another friend $20, I've distributed my money between those three people in a particular way, right? So that's a distribution. So distribution is how the stuff is divvied up. So how are the frequencies broken up or divvied up in the sample that we are analyzing? So why we like these things? Because they tell us about the nature of these variables in our sample. So we're going to start with the idea of a frequency table. A frequency table is simply a table that shows classes or intervals of data entries with a count of the number of entries in each class. The frequency, abbreviated F, or sometimes F of X, where you'd write F of X like this. Let me show you how this might look. So it would be an F, and then in parentheses, an X. And this says the frequency of the variable X, right? So that is f of x, which is also used. So it's the frequency of a class, number of data entries in the class. So you can do this for grouped or ungrouped data. Ungrouped would be leaving the data exactly as it exists. So if you ask people to report their ages, and someone says I'm 27 years old, someone says I'm 29 years old, someone says I'm 43 years old, every year the way the data were reported would be their own thing. But if you were making it grouped, you would say take all the 20s and do 20 to 29. And then you'd say how many people were in their 20s. Or 30 to 39, how many people were in their 30s. So now I've grouped it, I'm still using frequency. So instead of saying how many people are 27, ungrouped, I'd say how many people are 20 to 29 years old, grouped. So here's an example of a grouped frequency table. This came from a small class that I had. And I gave them a survey and asked them how sarcastic they thought they were. So I had some people who tried to give me numbers that weren't allowed because the scale was from 1 to 9, 9 being highly sarcastic, 1 being not at all sarcastic. Some people, not surprisingly, wrote 13 just to show how sarcastic they really were. Right. So, so here is my breakdown of sarcasm in my community college statistics class. And you see here that what I've done is group the data. So I have the classes, and here the classes are all equal and closed, which are two important rules we'll talk about for constructing classes for tables well. And so equal means that every group, right, every interval or class spans the same range. So it's the, called a class width. The class width is the difference from the upper class limit, the UCL, and the lower class limit, the LCL. And you, then you add 1, which is called, when you add 1 to the range, it's the real range. So I think, think about it like this. If you talk about what's the range of numbers that go from 1 to 5, right? If you said, well, 5 minus 1 is 4, well, okay, but the actual range, if you count it on your hands, right? Put your hands up and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. How many fingers go up that span 1 to 5? You have 5 fingers up. So that's called the real range. So the real range is the range plus 1. So the range is simply the maximum minus the minimum. The biggest value in your data set minus the smallest value in your data set is the range. Okay, The max minus the min. Now if you take that and you add 1, 
you now have what's called the real range. Okay, so those are two separate statistics. Okay, the range is simply the max minus the min. The real range is the max minus the min plus one. So it gets the entire span. So here, when we're doing class width, right, we are using a real range concept because we're doing the biggest number, the upper class limit. So here, the biggest number is three. The lower class limit here, the smallest number is one. So then we do three minus one equals two, but to get the class width, we add one. So our class width is three. So how many numbers does that class span? Well, one, two, three. I have three fingers up, right? So this class is three wide. How many is this? Four, five, six, three wide. Seven, eight, nine, three wide. So these classes are all what we would call equal width. They all have a class width of three, which is the upper minus the lower plus one. Okay, when we make classes, when we're doing grouped tables or grouped histograms, histograms generally better ungrouped. Talk about that in a second. But if we do a group table, which helps to summarize the data, you can imagine if I hadn't done a summary of this and I just threw up 28 numbers, right? How do I know there's 28 numbers right there? My total frequency is 28, right? So I have 28 people. And if I just threw up 28 numbers on the screen between one and nine, that wouldn't tell you anything interesting. But if I put it in a table, I can quickly extract the story. So I can say, okay, most people, how do I know that? Here, 20. Most people are highly sarcastic. A sarcasm score from seven to nine, right? So what this tells me is most students in this class reported being highly sarcastic, right? Whereas almost no one, only one person, reported a very low sarcasm level. So that's what this table is doing. It is telling us the variable values. Here we've made classes of them, right? Because it's grouped. So this is the classes for sarcasm. That's the variable, right? Because it can vary between people. Different people have different levels of sarcasm. The classes, the values that can the variables can take, how often do they occur? That's the frequency, right? So here we see that most people are highly sarcastic. There's a few people in this moderate group and almost no one in this low group. Now we can take these raw frequencies, so these could be annotated f or f of x, where f of x means the frequency of some x variable. So here it's the frequency of sarcasm. So the x variable here is sarcasm. That is what we measure, right? So we could say, what's the freq frequency of sarcasm, right? But that is our x variable. So if we said f of x, we're saying the frequency of sarcasm scores, okay? And then we can take these raw scores and we can do percentages with them. So a relative percent is simply taking the frequency for a given class or given interval and dividing it by the total right? That's a frequency where basically this serves as the denominator. So one divided by 28 is 3.5 percent. Now one divided by 28 is actually 0 0.0357, right? But I move the decimal over two times when I multiply by 100 to turn a proportion into a percentage. So if you just do one divided by 28, right, you are not going to get 3.57, right? You're going to get the proportion. But when we do that and then we multiply that by 100, that turns it into a percent. Percent means per the 100. So the natural version is actually proportions, and we'll use those a lot in statistics. But a lot of people are used to speaking in percentages. So to take a proportion and turn it into a percentage, you just multiply by 100, right? So this is a fractional form. And if I solve this and don't multiply by 100, so I get 0 0.0357. 0 0.0357 is the proportion of people with one to three level sarcasm, right? So this is the fraction, that would be the proportion, and the percentage is when I multiply that by the 100 and I get 3.57, okay? So 25%, seven out of 28, right? Had a four to six, and 71.43% had seven to nine. Now next to this we have the cumulative percent. And this is where you continue to add up. 
So notice what we do here is we say how many people have sarcasm this high or lower, right? So up to this point, right? Like a cumulative exam, it measures everything up to this point. Same idea here. So if we come to this one, how many people have a frequency up to this point? Well, up to three, there's only one person. So notice these two things, the relative and cumulative match. But at the next one, now we're going to say how many people have a sarcasm up to six? So from one to six. So now we don't just say seven. We say one plus seven or eight. So that's why if we add these together, 1 plus 7, we get 8. And if we take 8 and divide it by 28, we get this cumulative percent. But notice you can also get this by adding the relative percentages. 25 plus 3.57 gets us this 28. So it's the same idea because what, they're, what we're looking at here is just everyone up to this point. And so that's why when we get to 7 to 9, we now have everybody, right? All 28 people have scores between 1 and 9, because that's what the range was. And so we have a cumulative percent of 100. Now, a lot of times people will flip cumulative percents. Um, and this would be like when they do percentile ranks for things like SAT scores, right? So if they say you're in the 94th percentile, that means that your score is and you're doing cumulative percents, you are above 94% of people, right? So you're doing cumulative up to you. So you're asking how many people have scores up to your score, 94% of them. And that's kind of inverting the cumulative percentage. So these things are all used and they're all easy enough. They all come simply from counting. <laughs> that's all it is, counting. And then these are divisions, right? So we're just counting how many people have these values. And it's just a wonderful way to summarize the data, to see the story in the data very quickly and easily instead of looking at a bunch of random numbers on a screen. We just have to know how they're organized. So again, we mentioned that one important rule here is that all the classes are equal. Another important rule is that all the classes should be closed. What that means is I shouldn't have some group that says, you know, like something like seven or more. Right? And the problem with something like this is I have no idea where more ends. And so it might not be equal. Right, If I have seven or more as a group, what if one person is 200? <laughs> so that, that fails to capture the spread, the distribution of the data effectively. Sometimes people do this just for simplicity of practice, but it causes problems. One example is income. Income is often put into a few groups. People are used to hearing things like, you know, um, lower, working, middle, upper cl for classes to represent incomes. Now, these all have their own ranges. So, for example, lower classes like under 28,000 and working classes like 28 to 40,000. You could double check these numbers, but middle class goes up to like, um, 149 or something like that. And so you have very unequal groups, right? So people have this idea that like you're only one step up, but the groups are not at all equal with the groups. Like the span of income varies enormously between those things, right? And so it, it fails to capture appropriately what the distribution of income looks like, right? And then of course, when you have like upper class and you have like I think it's 250, not 150. 250,000 or up is upper class, right? So if you have upper class starting at $250,000 per year for income, but you have people making billions of dollars of income, think about how enormous that class is and you fail to capture the true disparity in income and the true distribution of the variable because you haven't put it into equal closed classes. You left one class open $250,000 or more, which doesn't let you know what the upper limit on it is, right? The upper class limit. And it, it misleads people by looking at these groups and thinking that they represent some kind of equal separation based on income when they don't represent any kind of equality because they are not equal with. So a good rule to effectively and unbiasedly summarize when you do grouping for frequency tables is to have equal classes and closed classes. Don't say three or fewer. Don't say seven or more. Say seven, two, whatever, and make all of them equal. And that way people get a true sense of the span of your data, right? 
So if you're trying to figure out, well, how many classes do I need or how wide are my classes going to be, uh, you can get your class width by taking the real range of your data and dividing by the number of classes you want to make. So here, for example, the real range of my data, remember the real range is the maximum, 9, minus the minimum, 1, right, plus 1. So the real range here is 9. So if the real range is 9, and I want to make, that's this top number, 9, and I want to make how many classes? One, two, three, three classes, right? Okay, so 9 divided by 3 equals 3. So my class width should be 3, which we already identified is true. 1, 2, 3, that's 3 wide. 4, 5, 6, that's 3 wide. 7, 8, 9, that's 3 wide. So you can use this simple real range over number of classes equals class width. And of course, you could rearrange that if you knew what class width you wanted and what the real range was, you could say how many classes you'd get out of it or so forth. But this is kind of basic frequency table construction. So hopefully that helps a little bit in understanding concepts uh, in making group frequency tables. Now, other ways we often represent frequency are visually with something like a histogram. So a histogram shows frequency using a chart depiction. And in a histogram, you always have the variable values on the x-axis and some frequency, density, or probability function on the y-axis. So the y-axis simply tells you how much the things happen, and the x-axis tells you what the value of the variable is. So this y-axis is frequency. So this is the number of people. This is, this is real data from the 2005-2006 Health Behaviors in School Age Children study done in the United States. So this data, um, they ask a nationally representative large sample of children from like 6th to 12th grade a variety of questions about health, school, family, all kinds of things. So one of the questions in this data set that's publicly available that I use for class purposes, they have a question about how many days have you used alcohol in the last year? So here you have thousands and thousands of kids, right? Because you see the highest number is almost 4,000 for the zero, right? So there's a lot of kids in this. This is a lot of data represented in this chart. So the number of days, notice zero to up to, this would be like 365, right? Which would be every day in the past 12 months. So X here is the number of days that they used alcohol, the variable values, number of days. The frequency are how many students reported that number of days of drinking, okay? So what we can quickly see from this chart is that most students, most students report drinking very little. You see that the highest numbers here, but then we see that there are spikes as we go down. This is probably like kind of rounding where people put their numbers, but so we can see that most students don't drink much. There are some students that are reporting drinking basically every day of the year and they're 6th to 12th graders. So this distribution is what we would call here a positively skewed distribution, right? Points out this way. So skew is when you have values that outlie in a direction. So you have a high peak and a strong skew in a positive direction because if you thought of a number line, right? The negative numbers would be down here, the positive numbers would be up here, and the direction of the skew, that is where it slants towards, is positive. This is a right or positively skewed distribution. Okay, now, see, this very quickly can tell us a story about this data, where if I had taken, you know, 25,000 numbers between 0 and 365, which is what this picture represents, right, is probably something like 25,000 students reports of how much they drink. That would make no sense. Like, how would I even filter that? But if I put it in a histogram, I can quickly see the story that there are some clear spikes in drinking, right? There are a lot of students who do drink some, but most, the majority of students seem to drink very little. And the mode, the most re common reported value here was actually zero days of drinking. So that's the mode, the most common. Not that it's the majority, it's just the most common, right? So this is an example of a histogram, which is a very useful way to summarize frequency and to see the distribution that it how thing so how alcohol use is distributed, right?
Now, there are a bunch of other graphics that I'm going to mention here quickly, but your text doesn't focus on them quite as much. So there are things like stem and leaf plots. Um, these are designed to kind of be a combination of something that looks like a bar graph and still reports the actual values in the data. So the stem is the starting digit, and the leafs are the trailing digits. So what these are are real data about state-level SAT scores, uh, back when the SAT was still on 1600 point score system. And so what we can quickly see looking at this is very few states, in fact only one state, scored over 1100. 1107 was the state average, right? You see most states, how do I know that? Look how long this trail, see? So notice how this gives us some bar graph influence. We can see that this is the most frequent because there are more observations here. So most states have an average SAT in the 1000 range, right? Um, we see that there are also a good number of states in the 8s and 9s, right? So this would be 844. That's one state. This would be 854. So this is the this is the stem. It's where you start, and then you append the leaf onto the stem. So there was a score that was 844. There was a score that was 854. There was a score that was 865. And so this is a way to visually depict your data while still providing the actual numeric values. Whereas the histograms, the bar charts, they aggregate so you don't see the individual values, right? So these can be useful, but they're not all that common. Much more common are things like histograms, bar charts, and pie charts or graphs, right? Uh, in Excel, they like to call them column charts when they go vertically, but those are most typically called bar charts. Excel calls bar charts the ones that are horizontally oriented. So just be aware of that if you're using Excel to make graphs. Uh, but I will just typically refer to a bar chart or a bar graph. So this is a grouped, where I've grouped data. So this is the same SAT data, and I've made groups here. So here I have the greater than and the less than, right, which isn't maybe ideal, right? Um, so maybe what I should have done was 801 to 900 and 1100 to 11 or 1101 to 1200, right? That might have been better. Uh, but here, look at I made that mistake of simplifying, and then you don't know how high the numbers go or how low they go. Uh, but this is what's called the Pareto chart, which is like a bar chart or graph that instead of going in order of the values on the x axis, it goes by the most frequent. So here you quickly see the most common observation is SAT scores from 1000 to 1100, right? And there's 19 states that report those types of SAT scores. You can also see that visually in a pie chart here. Um, now, bar graphs, pie graphs are best for data that are on nominal or ordinal scales of measure. If you have interval or ratio, you don't want to do this. Interval or ratio data are best represented on a histogram, okay, because the histogram assumes a continuum of scores. Notice there's this whole span that just goes along, along a continuum on a number line, right? Whereas bar graphs, pie charts, assume things exist in groups, which is why I grouped the data for them. So it's important to think about that when you're using things like if I was going to make a graph to represent eye color or race, I would want to use something like a bar graph or a pie graph. I couldn't use a histogram to indicate race in a meaningful way. However, if I was going to do a distribution of weight, well, weight is on a continuum and would be better represented in a histogram than it would in a par, bar or pie graph. So you have to think about your data when you're choosing how to represent it visually. Okay, We always have to think about our data. Rule number one in statistics, the computer can do all the cool stuff. It can make the graphs. It can make the tables. It can analyze the things. But you have to know which type of analysis or visualization is best for your type of data. So always think about your scale of measurement, your type of data, before you make these types of decisions, right? So again, if you have things that are nominal or ordinal, they would be better for bar graphs or pie graphs. If you have things that are interval ratio, they're better for histograms, okay? So keep that in mind when you're trying to do data visualization. Now, a type of data visualization that we won't talk about too much now, but I want to introduce is a scatter plot. This is different than the other data visualizations we've seen, 
because a scatter plot has two variables being measured a bar graph, a pie chart, a histogram, as we've described them here for frequency alone, they represent only one variable. So they're what, what is called univariate. But here, this is what's called bivariate. Here, I have measured two variables, bi, two, variate, two variables. Here, I've measured average teacher salary for the 50 states and the state's combined SAT scores. So this is from the same, again, real data, and a scatter plot allows you to see if there is a type of association between those two variables. Here I'm indicated that association with a straight line, what's called a linear fit. So it's a, it's a linear association. It's assuming that a straight line characterizes the relationship. So what this says is as teachers' salary increases, combined SAT scores for the state are decreasing. So I bet you're wondering, wait, hold on. You're saying if I pay teachers more, students do worse on their SATs? I bet you're thinking that. If you're thinking that, you're wrong. <laughs> so why are you wrong? Because you're making a common fallacy that we tend to make when we think about data as humans. And that is you're assuming that a correlation implies something about causation. You're assuming because there is a relationship here, the relationship must be a cause and effect one. So there are several problems with that. First and foremost, this data is observational, not experimental. And we talked about in week one that you can't really infer causation without experimentation. We cannot randomly assign teachers to their pay levels. Can you imagine that teacher who you randomly assign to get paid $3 for the year? They're going to be a little frustrated. <laughs> so you can't randomly tell a teacher what they're going to get paid. They get paid on a variety of different allegedly merit-based things, right? So we can't randomly assign teachers to pay to see how that affects SAT performance. So this can't be causal, right? It's simply observational. But if it's observational, we have to ask another question, and that is, is there a confound? Remember we talked about in week one those third variables, which can be pesky and mess things up. So we talked about the idea that, you know, a relationship between um, the number of churches in an area and the amount of crime in that area, and that as churches increase, so does crime. But if you account for population density, that relationship disappears. Well, you have the same type of thing here. So if you think about it for a second, there's probably a variety of variables that relate to both SAT performance by students and teacher salary that aren't being considered but should be. So for example, teachers often get paid in areas where they have more kids per class. Hmm. Well, if you have more kids per class, it might be hard to be as effective. Uh, teachers often get paid based on commensurate wage in the area. So, for example, a teacher in New York or California will get paid more than a teacher in North Dakota. And that's not because they're better teachers. That's because of economic and social environmental factors. So a lot of things impact teacher salary that have nothing to do with how effective they are as a teacher. Now, these things could also affect combined SAT scores, right? So... There are also different states that have different rules about who's mandated to take the SAT and all these types of things. And once you put in a couple things like population density and other factors, you start to find out that the relationship between teacher salary and combined SAT scores is actually inverted. So higher teacher salary controlling for things like population density, uh, commensurate wages in the area, and things like that, actually higher salary relates to increased SAT scores. So this goes back to the fact that we have to be careful in statistics. We have to remember and consider that you always must think about the method used and you must think about the limits, okay? That's your job as a consumer. I can't possibly inform you about everything. If you read a full article done by a scientist, they'll always include the possible limitations and things like that. But when you just read something printed in the news, they're probably not going to do that. They may not be able to think of them all themselves because they're not maybe data experts, right? So this is part of just being an informed part of a community in a world where data is everywhere, right? So you should avoid the temptation to see some kind of picture like this and go, oh my goodness, look at when you pay teachers more, students do worse. So let's just pay teachers less and everyone will be smarter. Um, that's probably not the right conclusion. And you might think I'm biased, but <laughs> it's probably not the right conclusion. So always think about those issues. Think about the method used to get the data, possible confounds, 
other factors, okay? So this is a scatter plot. You take two variables, x and y, and then you graph them so that a data point in the scatter, a data point represents a single state and its salary and SAT score. Okay, we'll see more of these when we talk about correlation and regression. So why do we care about all these things? Why do we care about frequency? Why do we care about distributions? Here I have a quote from David Howell from his stats book. Um, he retired recently from the University of Vermont, lifetime, long lifetime professor of teaching statistics for psychology and behavioral sciences. And in his book, he repetitively says, if we know something about the distribution of events, we know something about the probability that one of those events is likely to occur. So the whole idea here is when we know these distributions, we can say what's common and what's not, which allows us to start making probabilistic determinations. If I know something about the distribution of human height, right, that is how is height distributed in the human population, if I know something about that, then I can start saying, whoa, that is an adult who is nine foot four. That is highly improbable. That is unlikely to occur. The only reason I can make that statement is because I have some sense of the distribution. Right? So if you notice in your own life, you have a bunch of concepts about distributions. What seems to be typical? How tall do trees tend to be? What's the normal size of an ant? How much, to, how much do people normally eat? Right? How much do dogs normally weigh? You have all these concepts and you know that there's a variability. Dogs don't all weigh the same, right? People don't all weigh the same. But you know that there's some kind of spread. If I said there was a dog that weighs 300 pounds, you'd be like, what? Right? Even though there's enormous amount of variability because you have some sense of a distribution. So distributions are important in statistics because they set the foundation of probability, which is essential to statistical process. So when we talk about distributions, we'll see more of this when we talk about normal distributions. They're characterized by three major factors. One is modality. One is kurtosis, or the peakedness. And the final is symmetry, also called skewness. So let's take a look at each of these in turn. Modality is simply how many peaks a distribution has. So a unimodal, una meaning one, a unimodal distribution has one peak, right? A bimodal, bi meaning two, a bimodal distribution has two peaks. And of course, you could have trimodal or multimodal, implying that there are several values that are equally likely to occur. Because remember, the mode is simply the most frequently occurring value. More on that in Chapter 3. A uniform distribution is a distribution that has no mode, which means every value is equally likely to occur. It's uniform. There's not a variability in how frequently things happen. Okay? So this is modality. The second thing is kurtosis. Kurtosis reflects how peaked a distribution is. So normally kurtotic is this nice kind of middle hill shape, right? It's like, okay, you know, so you see the tails in the middle, this kind of good, what's called bell-shaped curve often, right? A platykurtic, platy, like the word plateau, in fact, the word platypus also comes from that. Platypus from the Greek means flat foot. So there you go. So, so platykurtic here is, is that the distribution is flat, right? So it's not very peaked. And so it looks like what? A plateau, right? It kind of looks like a platypus too. You draw like a face on here and the tail back here. So, so here this distribution is flattened. So that means that the mode is not a very like strong mode. A lepto, lepto, like the word leap, right, to go very high, leptokurtic distributions are very peaked. So there's fewer things in the tails and a lot in the center, and the peak is very high. Okay, so this is kurtosis, or the peakedness of a distribution. And we mentioned earlier the idea of skewness, so let's revisit that quickly. Skew distribute, the skew of a distribution, or its symmetry, reflects whether or not the tails are approximately equal. So a symmetric distribution is, is a mirror image on each side of the middle. So here I split it down the middle, right, which is based on the central tendency, more on chapter three. So I split it down the middle, right, and then I look on each side and I see that it is symmetric around the mean, right? And so what this tells me is this is a symmetric distribution. It matches perfectly. This side looks just like this side. 
A negatively skewed distribution is a distribution where it tails off to the left, sometimes called left skew. So the peak is over here and it goes this one direction, right? So you've got some values that are extreme kind of like unlikely to happen and much further from what you'd expect. So you see the average here is six, the median in mode, you know, the median is seven, the mode is eight, right? So you see that most people are over here, but there are some people who are very low, like a value of one. This is negatively skewed, right? Positively skewed is just the opposite. So the mode here is zero, the median is one, and the mean is just under two. Well, if that's the case, we see most people score from zero to two, but there's someone who scores seven, right? So that's a positively skewed distribution. Distributions like income are often positively skewed. So if you think about in America, you've got guys like Jeff Bezos, who's now worth the first person in history to be worth over $200 billion, happened earlier this week. Um, Bezos' income is astronomical compared to the rest of the society. Um, his income would go so far out in that right tail of positive skew, it would blow your mind. And so this is the idea, like, okay, the modal American income is going to be lower than the median, is going to be lower than the mean, because it is positively skewed, right? And so these ideas of skewness or symmetry also define distributions, and they're important to think about. We'll see more on why that is in the coming weeks. And so these all go to an important concept that we'll learn about in the future, which is the normal distribution, the normal curve. And a normal distribution is unimodal, is symmetric around the mean, and it is normally kurtotic, right? It's not too peaked, it's not too flat. And so this normal distribution will be the first distribution we spend a lot of time talking about in the coming weeks. We don't need to spend too much time worrying about it right now, but it just sets the foundation for how distributions get us to concepts of probabilities, which will be essential in statistics. Hopefully this gives you some sense of some of the concepts for this week, frequency, grouped and ungrouped frequency tables, histograms, and other types of data visualization. Hopefully you see why these are useful as ways to quickly summarize and depict our data rather than just giving out a bunch of raw values.